All right, so it is about five minutes after 12. We'll go ahead and get started. Again, thank you again for everybody who came in person. There are still some lunches available, so feel free to trickle in if you're on virtually. Um, but yeah, so this is uh, our first Ethics for Lunch for 2024. Uh, today's topic, we are going to be talking about violence in healthcare, the notion that healing shouldn't hurt. This has been a really big topic that's been um, talked about at Henry Ford, as well as healthcare institutions across the country. So we felt this would be a really good opportunity for staff to learn about what's coming in from a legal standpoint, what can we do to help prevent, to help mitigate, to help de-escalate, and what resources are available for staff in any role that staff holds. Um, so we'll start with um, the CME information. Now for anybody who is gonna be looking for uh, social work continuing education credits, please also log in for CME. This is gonna be your sign in and your evaluation will count as your sign out. Um, so that way you are eligible for your continuing education credit. Um, also, if you are virtual, this will be popped into the chat periodically throughout the presentation. Um, at the end, you will see this QR code for the evaluation. So if you are looking for a CME or if you're looking for continuing education or certificate of attendance, you'll scan the QR code at the end and um, that will get you to the evaluation. If you have any questions, my email is at the bottom and you'll see it again at the end of the presentations. Uh, you can always email me for any questions that may come up. So we are going to start today's discussion. Uh, with Bob Farr. He is with our, oh, um, no disclosures from any of our uh, panelists, um, but he is with Senior Counsel, um, and so we're going to start our discussion with Bob. Hello, everyone. I love doing uh, lunch uh, sessions because everybody has food with them. They're generally happy. So <laughs> if you're unhappy with your food, you also have a weapon to throw at me if you uh, uh, if are unhappy with it. But this is really about no violence in the workplace and an important concept that you don't come to work uh, and to getting assaulted at work is not a part of your job. I hope that you've never heard that from anybody. If you ever have, just reject that and call us. Um, we're not going to uh, let that happen here at Henry Ford, okay? So uh, I wanted to start with a, a couple of recent legislative uh, changes to Michigan's criminal code. And let's see, the arrow buttons are what are going to work. You may start seeing some of these posters around the facilities, okay? Uh, and it's a reminder to our visitors and our patients that there have been some changes to Michigan's criminal code which provide for some enhanced sentencing um, should they engage in any inappropriate conduct at work that involves uh, assaulting somebody, okay? And so um, as much as I want you to enjoy your lunch, I also want you to feel free to interrupt me during this if you have a question. I want this to be a little bit less of a presentation, more of a dialogue about, about these changes, okay? So don't be afraid to, to stop and interrupt me. But there's uh, the fine print that some nice lawyer created at the bottom of this. And uh, that's actually a statutory provision that we pr put that on our notices inside the facilities. It provides some key uh, citations to the various laws um, that, that are applicable under the circumstances. And it's just a warning to our visitors and our patients that we have some expectations of their behavior while they're here as well, okay? And so let's see, these are the recent changes. There were House bills introduced last year uh, revising three sections of the uh, MCL as the Michigan Compiled Law. This is the criminal code that was re uh, revised. Um, one was a revision to the simple assault and battery. The second was a revision to the aggravated assault with injury. And then the third was to felonious assault. So the difference between those, and you're about to get law school 101 here for a real quick brief. Um, we'll give you P numbers and you'll be honorary attorneys after this. So, um, is that simple assault is just an a, a unwanted touching, okay? Um, a shove, a bump, a punch, something like that, okay? Not a great deal of injury or anything like that, but. Um, it, in a civilized society, that's not acceptable. You just can't do that. And so that's what a simple assault is. Uh, an aggravated assault is if that gets a little more serious and results in an injury, 
bruising, a broken jaw, those kinds of things. Something that right, might actually lead to somebody having to come to a, an emergency department, okay? Um, stitches, things like that. And then um, the third one is felonious assault. That's generally with a weapon, um, knife, um, gun, those kinds of things, much more serious, okay? Um, what the revisions did is that it provided for enhanced fines in each of those provisions, um, but with some exceptions, uh, and some exceptions that we're not really happy with, okay? Uh, in the case of simple assault, it provided for an additional $500 fine uh, if the assault was against a healthcare worker, and that includes volunteers in a healthcare setting, so anybody in a clinical setting, okay? Um, for the aggravated assault, it provided for an additional $1,000 in fines. And then for a felonious assault, it provided for an additional $2,000 in fines. It's basically, that's a doubling of, of the existing fines for assaulting somebody who's a healthcare worker or healthcare volunteer. The problem is in the red print here, okay? If the person who committed the assault was a patient receiving care, there are not enhanced fines, okay? But there is an acknowledgement by the legislature um, that a patient receiving care can be charged with these, these crimes, okay? You'll see at the bottom that the provision says that they may still be subject to prosecution under this section, and those provisions are actually in the fine print down there at the bottom, okay? So they do have notice that their behavior um, might come under prosecutorial scrutiny, um, and that they could be charged with that. And so that is the extent of my slides. I tend to want to keep it pretty short. Um, I'm not sure why the legislature provided that exception, why it is they thought that a patient um, couldn't be subject to the enhanced fines simply because they're a patient. I, I looked at the legislative history of this provision. I didn't see any dialogue among the legislators about this. I suspect it's the case that the legislatures felt that patients aren't always at the hospital but through their own free will. They may have been brought to us um, by an ambulance, something like that. I'm not sure why that excuses their poor behavior, um, but that might be the compromise that occasionally has to happen in the legislature in order to get a bill through, okay? Um, the concern, of course, is that the patient isn't always thinking, oh boy, if I punch this physician or this nurse, it's going to cost me $500 more than it would if I, if I weren't a patient. Um, that's just not part of the calculus that goes into being assaulted, okay? There are generally some other things that are happening in that space. Um, but uh, I do want to say that it's absolutely the case that Henry Ford is culture is not going to accept assaults in the workplace, okay? And there are resources available to you, including the entirety of the, the Henry Ford legal department. Um, it can be a little concerning about whether to pursue some charges against somebody who's, who's a patient, right? You, you're a care provider, and you don't think of yourself as being in that adversarial relationship with them and wanting to pursue charges against them. But we want you to understand that Henry Ford encourages you to, or at least doesn't discourage you from pursuing those charges, and we will support you if you want to do that, okay? You have a, a really wonderful security team here at Henry Ford. Uh, all of the attorneys have plenty of court experience. We can help coach you through what that process looks like. We also have pretty good working relationships with the local prosecuting attorneys as well. I happen to have gone to, to law school with one of the prosecutors in Macomb County, okay? Um, and they can certainly put us in touch with other prosecutors in other counties as well. I'm also a former police officer. Before going to law school, I was a deputy sheriff for 10 years. So I have lots of experience in working with victims of assault to help them understand what does the courtroom testimony process look like? What can you expect from the uh, defense counsel? Um, and uh, to help kind of prepare you for what that process looks like, okay? So let me pause there. Yeah, go ahead. So um, what about kind of the, um, the flip side? What is the responsibility of the victim or here the provider in terms of nurse, doctor, technician, if they were either physically um, assaulted or inappropriate touching or something like that? What is their responsibility to the patient, or does their responsibility end at that point? 
So we, we have become much more aggressive with our administrative discharge process than we have in the past, okay? Um, you, you may have worked at places before or even during periods here at Henry Ford where there was a reluctance to use that process. That reluctance is slowly disappearing, okay? Um, we realize that we need to be more supportive of our, of our personnel, and if we have a patient who can't seem to control their behavior in the facilities, we will administratively discharge that patient. Now, it depends on the setting, of course. In the emergency department, we have to deal with EMTALA, uh, and so we take on all patients, um, no matter what their circumstances are, even if they had been administratively discharged for regularly scheduled visits, okay? If they have an emergency situation, we have to treat them, okay? What that means, though, is we have to stabilize them. That's it. Once they're stable, we can remove them from the facility under EMTALA without violating the statute, okay? So if we have a patient who is a frequent flyer, so to speak, with their poor behavior, once they're stabilized, we're happy to work with you to get them quickly discharged from the facility so that they're not a threat to the organization. And we have those kinds of patients that come in once in a while who use it for housing, so to speak, especially in, you know, in the wintertime when it's incl inclement outside. So. Yeah. yeah. I know that there's often a lot of, uh, of informal stories and reports that kind of float around through the different units. Uh, and I don't know if this is a question that you may have in, but do we have any objective evidence in terms of numbers uh, within our hospital that show an increase in these events? Are we declining? Stabilized. We are working to um, build out a database so we have a better understanding and better transparency into what our particular st statistics are and whether maybe there are some facilities that are experiencing a heightened problem or periods in which the problems are heightened, right? And we're going to see if there's a core. We're going to test whether there's a correlation between full moons and assaults in the ED, okay? Um, uh, but, you know, joking aside, Yes, there is an effort. We are collecting the data. There hasn't been a great deal of, of organization of that data in the past, but there is organization of that data nationwide um, by the American Health Association, American Health Law Association. They're creating a database because we're, we're just seeing it in the news, right, that, that sometimes very violent um, uh, uh, incidences of shootings in hospitals. Um, sometimes hospitals get viewed as a soft target, right? And our hospital isn't or shouldn't be. We have a, a 278 member security team, many of them armed. Um, I hope that that brings a sense of confidence to you as you walk through this facility and you see those professionals walking around. Um, in fact, we've even seen a really excellent um, response from one of our security personnel about eight months ago, I think it was. A, um, a distressed visitor came into the facility, uh, a former patient, and was in the main lobby of this, of this entranceway with a knife threatening people. And our security personnel did a wonderful job uh, working together to distract that person so one of the security personnel could get a grip of that person rather than shoot the person, okay, which is the last possible resort, especially inside a building where there are, are other people downrange from that and we don't want to hurt anybody, including the patient. So, And to your point about responsibilities, I think you all as clinicians have a sense of why is it that this person is engaging in this kind of behavior? Sometimes patients come to us and they're emotionally distressed. Their, their problems aren't just physical, they have other medical problems as well. And so maybe the, 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 uh, their self-control is not fully there, right? And so we have a sense of whether, they're, whether they have the ability to control their behavior, right? There are other patients who come in and they just are the Jekyll and Hyde patients, right? And they're going to get their way no matter what, and they have no, um, no hesitancy to using violence to get what they want. And that's not acceptable. And I want you to understand that's not acceptable. And if you want to pursue criminal charges against them, you have the full resources of the organization behind you to do that. We're also respectful of the fact that if you don't want to pursue criminal charges for whatever reason, that's also your choice, okay? Any thoughts on that? Any war stories to share? because I can learn from you as well. What can we do to better help you in the space? Yes. I just have a question. I work in trauma. There's a lot of situations that come up with when that I can speak about that's happening that cause our unit of 
monstrosity to the patient whose behavior was escalating, escalating. He had multiple traumatic injuries and was not what we would say medically ready for discharge. Um, by the end of the night, he was threatening to come back with a gun and kill everyone there when they got off work. Like he had a pretty discreet plan. And they were very afraid. So security came and they so we administratively discharged him. It was very well documented by the night physician. But it was very disturbing to um, the nursing staff that was on that night because he wasn't arrested. He was just brought down to the front door and discharged outside. And so they were you know, quite frightened about whether or not some retaliation was going to occur. So I'm just not sure in those situations what can be done or what kind of support we can provide for. Yes, very concerning, obviously. And uh, please, in those in those circumstances, share that with our security yeah. team. Um, we would not hesitate at all to bring in additional security resources for a period um, to make sure that we have uh, an abundance of resources available on the site to be able to respond if that person were to return to the site. Okay. We can also have security escort personnel to their cars so that you're not alone at any point and you have somebody with you to help protect you under those circumstances. Okay. There are no, no resources that we won't put into a, that type of situation. Now, why was that person not arrested uh, instead of just being allow allowed to walk out the door? So there are limits to the criminal law with respect to what, what people say without the Im immediate ability to carry it out. Right, like if I happen to not get along with somebody in here, and I say, you know, I don't like you or you, we'll go with you, okay? Um, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. And you better watch your steps because I'm going to be watching for you when you leave this facility, okay? And I just leave it at that. All right. Now that's a threat. We all understand that to be a threat. But I'm not standing there with a knife in my hand or a gun in my hand, and I'm not running up to him with my fists up like I'm going to immediately assault you, okay? And so without the uh, without the apparent intent to carry on that act right at that moment, there's no arrest that can be made, okay? All right. But an hour later, you're leaving and you're walking out to the parking lot and there I am, all right? That's an additional step in furtherance of what I've already threatened to do to you, right? And so now we're starting to get into the space of, yes, there probably can be an arrest made in under those circumstances, okay? And we can certainly tell somebody on discharge, you are not welcome to come back to the facility and if you come back, you'll be arrested for trespass. That's a common refrain. Our security department probably does it every day, okay? And they have no hesitation in taking care of that for you. So please do not, I, I can't emphasize this enough, please do not hesitate to lean in and ask for resources if you are uncomfortable with something, okay? If a patient has said something or even if they haven't said something and you just got that gut feeling that tells you that something could be wrong, let us know and the security team will step in and, and they will engage the legal team and if we need to uh, tell that person they're not welcome back on site, we'll do that. So. Yes, sir. Parameters to that limitation that you just talked about. Like, I can see how if somebody says something, you know, I'm going to come back and hurt you. You know, you can't really address them. But if somebody says, you know, I'm going to go to my house and get a bomb, and yeah. come back and leave the bomb in the hospital. Yeah, there, there's an endless number of permutations of of the facts, right? You can say, what if, what if, what if, and we can what if it to death. And that is the the constant problem for prosecutors' offices. Did that person go far enough or say enough or do something in furtherance of it? Like, you know, if that person, if after threatening our physician, I then immediately go to the local gun shop and buy a gun, that seems like an odd coincidence that right at that moment I need to go buy a gun, right? Um, and so that's probably going to be a step in, in the right direction toward giving the prosecutor enough facts to then say, yes, this person's taking some steps in furtherance of that, okay? Um, it's different for me to say that from here, and it, let's, let's back it up even further. It's different that if I'm saying, in, if I'm using my chart as a forum to make threats against my physician, 
okay? Because I'm at home doing that online. I'm not anywhere nearby, all right? I might be out in the parking lot doing that from my phone, okay? That's a little step closer. But if I'm in the same room with the physician, and if I start coming over here and telling him how much I dislike him, right? That's a different matter. I start putting my fists up. The officer's come and confront me. I've got a knife in my pocket, even if I didn't have it out yet. That's a step in furtherance of it. And I'll take that knife out. That's even a step further. It's probably at home. So there's like lots of shades of gray between black and white, um, from a point where we can't make an arrest to the point where we can't make an arrest. I wish I could give you a bright line test for that. All I can really do is kind of lay out, lay, lay that out for you. Okay. I guess the reason I asked specifically about the arm is to teach me that orientation as one of the emergency threats. The bomb? Did you say bomb threat? Yeah. Is, is it a different crime or does it change the, uh, when you're talking about the arrestability, if you will, if somebody says, you know, hey, I'm with, I'm with the hospital versus someone calls in and says, I want to find me. It does because, you know, we're going to have to see if there were any steps taken in furtherance of that, right? We'll call in some, we don't have a bomb squad on our security team, but we do work very closely with the Detroit Police Department. They're very cooperative, very responsive to the things, uh, threats like that, and they have those resources available, and, and we will request for their, their assistance, and if they find a bomb, well, that person has taken some steps in furtherance. It's one thing to be angry and vent online, I think I might blow up the hospital. It's another to actually go put together a, a, a bomb, and then it's another step yet to take that bomb to the facility and plant it somewhere. Like maybe I happen to know what car you drive and I leave it on your windshield or something like that. So each of those steps is a step in, in furtherance, right? But absolutely take every threat serious, okay? And, uh, and, and engage with the security team or reach out to the legal team. So um, I will say that my personal cell phone number is in the signature line of every email I ever send out. Um, you can find me in Outlook. I never want you to hesitate to use that number. If you want to just go look it up, program it into your phone, and if you've got a question, something that's bothering you, if it's keeping you up at night, it should keep me up at night as well until we get it resolved. Chatter in the chat is that uh, they're more worried about visitors than they are patients, and so they just want you to confirm that visiting the hospital is a privilege, it is not a right. It is absolutely a privilege, not a right. And, you know, I'm sure everybody has experienced the circumstance where you've got one patient and 30 relatives out in the waiting room, right? Mm -hmm. And we want to care for those relatives too, right? It, we, we had to have empathy for what it is that they're there for. But it is not a problem at all to say to them, leave one person here or two people here. Everybody else go home. The delegated contact person will follow up with you. It's not necessary to have 30 people in the waiting room. So, and, you know, we find a more empathetic way to say that than I've just said it, of course. Um, but it, it takes, you know, a little bit of time to get that message through. And eventually you've seen it. The families tend to dissipate after a little while. But it is the case that the bigger the crowd, the more likely there's going to be somebody in that crowd who's not going to be able to control their emotions about things, or they're going to be impatient because you don't have a solution to the, the medical problem in the first 30 seconds that the patient arrived, right? So that um, the, the more that we can do to reduce the number of people here, the better off we are. Yes. Hang on, I'm getting a little old. <laughs> but I know that there's um, gun metal detectors um, in the building and the police are strong. But is there any plan for the main entrance to have any gun metal detectors? There, there I is. I could have you also repeat the question for the virtual. Yeah, I'll, I'll come up to the mic and do that. <laughs> so the question was. Um, the, the organization is implementing medical detectors in some facilities, in the ED, for instance. Is there a plan to also implement that at the main entrance for visitors? I think there is, okay? Um, metal detectors are very expensive. They're also administratively um, can be a little bit awkward to use as well, all right, to run everybody in through a medical detector. Like, we've been to the airport. We know what going through the airport is like. It slows things down, okay? And so there's... 
we're working through how do we strike the balance between accessibility and safety so that it doesn't feel like what we went through right after 9-11 where everybody was taking their shoes off at the airport all the time, right? Um, but it's absolutely correct to say that the, the bigger threat probably comes from visitors than from patients themselves, right? And so if we're not screening uh, visitors, we might be missing the bigger part of the threat. And so the security team is aware of that, and they're working through the logistics and just the political aspects of what it looks like to have to have a medical a metal detector in the facility. So I think we'll get to that point. We're just not quite there yet. Yeah. Um, do the statutes for patient assaults apply in mental health settings as well as like psychiatric hospitals? Yeah. Yeah, this is a shortfall of the statute. It doesn't, it doesn't adequately describe whether it does or doesn't, okay? And this is the problem for the legislators because a, a behavioral health facility is different than a non-behavioral health facility. Um, they're there because they lack many of the capacities that regular patients don't, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that they're incapable of forming the intent necessary to commit a crime, okay? But those crimes that we're looking at here on the board are specific intent crimes, okay? And so any prosecutor that is presented with a case of a patient assaulting a, a clinician in a behavioral health um, facility is gonna be thinking about that as well, right? Um, that's why we have additional precautions in place in behavioral health facilities as well, right? Um, do you have any suggestions for us on how we can better do it? Please share it, yeah. yeah. I'll think about it. Okay, we don't have to do it right now, but call me, we'll go get lunch, we'll talk about it, all right? Because if you, because our, our security team can learn from you, all right? If there's something you can do to teach our security team about how they can do it better or how the, facilities um, management in the organization can adjust our facilities to make you safe, you safer. Please share that detail. So. Every hospital is a psychiatric hospital. Yeah. <laughs> That's just the employees. Patients may have psychiatric illness that are here for physical health problems um, and the complicated balance between yes. managing them. I think the other point that a lot of those patients that do you know, then go on to threaten or attempt to assault individuals may have comorbid psychiatric concerns that are driving them. Yeah, the, 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 a patient with a psychiatric problem can also have a non-psychiatric problem, and they don't immediately think to themselves, I need to go to Kingswood for this, right? They just go to the nearest ED, wherever it is, but they bring their psychiatric um, medical conditions with them as well, and that also affects the, the relationship and their ability to control their behaviors and their impulses. And I think the key message here is that regardless of their ability to control their impulses and behavior, the organization supports you, okay? And that means that if you're experiencing a problem with a patient, even a psychiatric patient, okay, um, we will be more willing than ever to consider administratively discharging that patient if they can't control their behavior, okay? Whether it's in the, the ordinary ED or it's in the psychiatric facility. All right. Any yeah. other last thoughts? Uh, otherwise, we will uh, step into our next presenter. Thank you, Bob, so much. Uh, so next, uh, bringing to the podium is Sergeant Paula Redman. She is with Henry Ford Health Police Authority, uh, and she is going to give us just a presentation on uh, what we can do as it's happening. Good afternoon, everyone. So we're going to be discussing workplace violence. We're going to be discussing the education for the roles of leadership, clinical staff, et cetera, et cetera, when this happens, as well as our security personnel, which would be us, and external law enforcement, DPD, Wayne State, et cetera, et cetera, and the reporting process for workplace violence. So someone asked for statistics, okay? The <coughs> FBI hasn't updated everything, but in 2021, the last time the Bureau of Labor Statistics did any kind of um, 
thing. We had 623,000 workers in the healthcare industry alone who experienced trauma, non-fatal workplace violence. 276,000 required days away from work, 90,000 took place in a hospital. And this is actually a worldwide phenomenon, as uh, Bob stated that, you know, we, we are just now getting to the point in the United States that we're gathering this information and putting it out frequently. <coughs> the World Health Organization states that worldwide, between 8 and 38 percent of all healthcare workers experience physical violence at least once during their career. Okay. Legal redress. Bob just went over exactly what I was going to state. In the state of Michigan, Public Acts 271272, which is the thing with the additional 93-day misdemeanor, the additional clauses and everything else, but it does not apply to patients currently in care. Whoops, need to go back one. How do I do that? <laughs> Get it too quick. Thank you. Our policy, as he stated, okay, we do not condone workplace violence by any individual on premises at any time or while they are engaged with business on or on behalf of us or premises. So if you have a vendor who happens to be out at a Henry Ford facility somewhere else and that vendor loses the, his or her mind, guess what? Zero tolerance requires that all allegations are investigated, appropriate actions are taken. This includes current and former employees. So if you've got a former employee that's recently been separated from uh, Henry Ford, they count. Okay. What is workplace violence? The Joint Commission. Workplace violence, any act or threat, verbal, nonverbal, written, physical, threatening, intimidating, harassing, <coughs> humiliating words or actions, bullying, sabotage, sexual harassment, physical assaults, any behavior of concern involving staff, practitioners, patients, or visitors. Okay, so if you feel like you're going to sexually harass somebody, don't do it at work. <laughs> Please. Please don't do it at work. <laughs> I was waiting for that. <laughs> So, you know, when you're looking at factors and, and gee, are there cues or are there some, you know, things that we can see that, you know, maybe something's happening, there are signs and behaviors that we might see. Take these in context, okay? Just because you come in having a bad day doesn't mean that this person's going to lose their mind and assault somebody. Just because somebody gets really, really quiet for a few days doesn't mean that they're going to come in with a gun, okay? But we are looking for escalating behaviors. Okay. Workplace violence, coworkers whose personality changes. If Susie Sunshine comes in and suddenly it's F bombs every which way and leave me alone, that's not normal. Okay. A patient who presents with mental illness, we were just discussing this, duress, extreme pain, disorientation. I'm sorry, anybody here ever, you know, be in really, really, really bad pain? Are you the most pleasant person to deal with at that point? Mm. You know? Visitors and family members, we were just discussing that, especially if they've been given unpleasant news. I'm sorry, you're stage four. There's nothing we can do except make you comfortable and go home. No, you're trying to kill my mom. I'm not taking it. It's going to be an emotional situation, not only for the patient, but for the family and the loved ones and their support team. Okay? This is huge. Someone flagged an epic via a memo or an email as being a threat. Pay attention to that. And please, when you are looking at the screen, for epic. Don't let them see that big red border around there because half of those patients know what that means. They know. What, what's that about? So, you know. A person whose facial and body expressions. Everybody here has pretty much got a pretty good feeling of, you know. So if somebody's like, I swear, he or she does this, who do you think you're talking to? I said, I'm going to. Who's going to stop me? I ain't afraid of. When you've got a person that's starting to use that kind of language and they're escalating, they are getting more and more hostile and they are a concern. So it is something to keep in mind. Any of these individuals may physically react without warning. It's something to think about. Yeah, who's going to stop me? And I might charge right at you. Or they might charge at security. They do it all the time. <laughs> okay. Strategies for preventing them if they're flagged. Okay. Notify your supervisor and your coworkers so a plan can be put into place before you have interaction with that person. Give yourself two or three minutes before you meet with that patient to know who that patient is. You might find out, oh, this person's already flagged as being violent. Hey, nurse manager, we need to take a look at this. 
hey boss, did you see this and this, you know, we can start developing a plan before you even come in contact with that person. Cannot stress this enough, if somebody threatens you, I'm gonna kick your butt. I swear I'm gonna meet you after work. I'm gonna find your car, whatever. Do not try to handle it alone. Get out of the room. Remove yourself from that instantly and report it immediately. That goes back to what he said. Get the security team involved, please get us involved. Get your manager involved, get your bosses involved, get your coworkers involved. Hey, this person just made a threat against me. Hey, this guy's threatening to come and kick my butt after work. This woman just told me what kind of car I drive because she followed me here. Those are all things that we can control. And control is power, isn't it? That, that's why people make threats, so they can feel like they're in control. Let's flip that table. Let's be in control, okay? If you observe a change in your coworkers' demeanor, ask them if they're okay. Let's start caring about each other again. Don't just assume somebody's having a bad day. Ask them. And if you aren't comfortable with it, I'm sorry. You may think that snitches get stitches, but I'm not snitching, I'm telling. Boss, hey, Susie's got a problem here. I think we need to talk to her. Yes, ma'am. Jill, are, is your team doing any education or support for the leaders on the units? to help assist their staff in this because I am in my role I'm on the units in different capacities and there was a patient being um, admitted to a unit had an FYI had all the things and um, I was letting the staff on the unit get the person admitted and I went and grabbed the assistant manager just so they had a heads up this patient's being admitted they're not right next to a nursing station there are different things that you know we might want to look at and their response was well they know where the restraints are which was not helpful to their staff in that moment at it, all. It doesn't make anyone comfortable when that's your response. Well, and it, it made the nurse feel not seen or heard yes. about their concerns. And to answer your question, unfortunately, that is on your leadership on your end. If your leadership contacts, and we have had it, hey, we've got a patient that's coming up on H5 that we need assistance with, can security stand by? Is we have the, had those requests, but they have the to come from your supervisors. I guess it's like the supportive conversation and how to better answer that concern. Again, that falls back on medical. We are separate. Right. Security is different. We do have discussions on how to handle that, but keep in mind that we're the ones that's coming in. By the time you sure. guys have called, the time for talking is over. Oh, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I mean, I've been in those situations. You know, sorry, by the time you know that happens, we're in there to, to restrain, take care of business and everything else and, and help you out. Or at least explain to this person that their behavior is not going to be tolerated here. You know, and we do have those conversations frequently. I'm sorry, you know, Mr. Smith, you know, Mrs. Smith, you can't throw your milk at them because you want skim. You, you can't do that. I'm sorry you wanted creamy peanut butter instead of, you know, chunky, but we don't have it. We can have those conversations. But your supervision should be availing themselves of training on their ends to help them communicate better. But there's nothing stopping you that if you don't feel comfortable and you don't feel seen, hey, security. <laughs> Can we get somebody and, just to do a walkthrough yeah, up here on each slide? It wasn't. It was just I was, I guess, group think of like asking suggestions from the group of how else we can support our leaders to support their staff in these moments where they feel very unsure to feel more supported in their being uncomfortable. Um, well, I'd like to add. Absolutely. To this. Yeah, I think that's a really wonderful suggestion. Um, we are trying to find ways in the legal team and in the security team to be more proactive in our support of mm -hmm. you as clinicians, okay? Mm -hmm. And so if it's the case that you think that some training for leadership on how to better support their teams in those circumstances mm -hmm. would be helpful, we would love to engage with you on that, okay? okay? And we'll develop a custom program around that to try and to help with them, okay? okay. Um, clearly, a pattern is emerging, as Paula has mentioned, not just in Detroit, it's a nationwide and it's international a problem, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. and, and so it's something that we need to be proactive about. We are going to be proactive about it. And Paul, Paul and I will talk a little bit more afterwards to see what, what we can put together afterwards. And we'll follow up with what's your name? Stacy. I'll, I'll step by and talk with you. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Paul. You're welcome. Um, if you, again, if you're made aware of any potential problem, get a hold of your management right away. 
And I can't stress this enough. If you see or you know something, say something. That's what Bob is stressing. That's what I'm stressing. Please come and talk to us. Talk to your security team. Talk to your legal team. Talk to your supervisors. Let us know what's going on. Because if we don't know something's going on, if we don't know that there's a problem, we can't address it. We, unfortunately, the psychic thing hasn't exactly kicked in with us yet. Okay. A lot of people have asked about when to call security. Okay. Subjects disturbing the peace in your business operations. If they're continuing to escalate vocally or physically, if they're getting louder and louder, if they're starting to throw things, they're starting to get angry, they're pulling out their leads, whatever, okay, time to get us up there. When they threaten harm to self or others, that goes back to the thing. What do we do if somebody threatens? What do we do if there's a bomb? Get a hold of us. We do not mind that, okay? If they implies they have or will get a weapon, that goes back to I'll see you in the parking lot after work. You know, subject uses violence against persons or property. We had a situation not too long ago and the officer didn't even know what to do. The person took an IV pole and was busting out all of the windows on like a sixth floor. Well, what are our options here? Uh, this person has a weapon, but they're also breaking and damaging <coughs> property, but they're also <coughs> exposing themselves to a sixth floor jump if they choose to. <coughs> At what point do we make that decision? And she was by herself waiting for her people to get up there to back her up. So sometimes we find ourselves even in security in situations where like there, we're limited on what we can do right away. Okay, but at least let us know. Phone number right there, sixteen one one two two. That is our security phone number. Don't fail to use it by all means. Anytime you need that. I'm a victim. I witness workplace violence. What do I do? We have a duty to report protocol, okay? If you see something, if you know something, if you know that something has happened, you have to report it to either your HR department, security, or our LA, okay? Any suspicious workplace activity, violence, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that is a tier one policy on workplace violence. This includes your managers, supervisors, and leaders. So if you are a manager, a supervisor, or a leader, and you are aware of something going on in your department, you have to make notifications. So what should leadership do? First thing, in every single role, it doesn't matter whether it's us or them, make sure your employee is safe. Make sure that employee is safe. If they need medical treatment, get them down to the ER so they can be seen. Notify all departments, including HR and security. Document it. Create an RL. If it involves two active employees, if these two guys decide they hate each other right now and they start brawling and we separate the two of them, we have to immediately schedule something with HR and we have to address the incident. If they have a union rep or whatever, it gets separated. Just so you know, the house manager has the right to suspend. So if you've got two employees that decide they're going to get into a fight, the house manager has the right to suspend both of them until HR can get involved. Okay, so if you've got two people fighting, HR can make that, or house manager can make that call. Your clinician responsibilities. Ensure the employee is safe, especially if this is a domestic violence situation. That is actually the second most likely incident. The first is patient on employee, but second is <coughs> domestic partner on employee. Go figure, okay? Make sure you flag it in EPIC, make sure you do an RL on it, make sure that you report the offender if they're a patient, you know, get it into EPIC, okay? It flags them for six months, minimum. And if you do it enough, we can probably put something permanent in there that this person is a violent offender, okay? Make sure that they're aware of the assault, make sure management's aware. I'm not saying put everybody's business out there, but if something happens on the day shift, midnight, afternoon, whatever, should also know, hey, this just happened to this you know, person. Document the injuries thoroughly because they might be used in a court proceeding. So again, if these two get into a fight, he's got a broken nose, he's got a broken arm, document that. Because if it gets to court, there you go. When in doubt, call security. Everybody's favorite active shooter. <laughs> Everybody asks me questions all the time on active shooter. Okay? First of all, there is a response plan checklist. So if you are a supervisor, leader, or manager, find your response plan checklist for your unit and start going through it. You can always ask us for a security assessment walkthrough. Somebody asked about what can we do about making sure that this is safe or feel seen. This is a great way to do that. 
This is a great way to get your very own personal security officer up there to say, hey, now that you're here, what can we do about this? So we can have those discussions with you, okay? Huge, identify good hiding places, rooms with door locks, heavy furniture and potential weapons before you need to do it, okay? Just like in your home. Ladies, who knows your kitchen better than you do? <laughs> who here would want to break into a house and be in somebody's kitchen? Yikes, this is our house. Nobody's gonna know what we have in here better than we do. Look around and find out what you can use for improvised weapons, what you can do to blockade, what you can do to save yourself, okay? No multiple ways to exit your area. Right now, if an active shooter came through that door, where's your other two exits without looking? One and two, absolutely, okay? Now, active shooter, okay? All right, yeah, everybody might start running for the door, but maybe a couple people here can go straight at them. I'm not going to sit there and go down like that. Sorry. <coughs> Sorry. I'm not messing with the big guy over there in the corner. Opposite. Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And, and, and Pastor, I love you to death, but I have the feeling if something like that happened, you, you, you would suddenly go all quarterback on him. <laughs> That's what it is. Now, for leaders and managers, make sure you establish a post event area. Where can you meet your team? If we have to get out of here in a hurry, where can I account for all of my people? And then have your coworkers' phone numbers, not so you can drunk dial them at three o'clock in the morning. <sighs> Any comments on drunk no, dialing people at three in the morning? Okay, just checking. <laughs> just checking. But, but storing a, a group email or a yes. group text somewhere yes. in your phone so if there is a genuine emergency like that, you have a quick resource one button, your whole team, is everybody okay? Right. right. People start checking and in, and then you get a sense of the problem. You, you might have somebody sitting at home with their feet kicked up watching Netflix going, yeah, I heard about the shots. I didn't stick around. So real quick, in the event of an active shooter, potential personnel, security alert, armed person, you know, please move away from this area into a safe location. You will hear that. Shots fired, what do we do? The FBI protocol, run, hide, fight, okay? Run in the opposite direction. If it's safe, hide somewhere with a locking door you can barricade. Fight the shooter only as a last resort. Turn your phones off. I cannot say that enough. Silence your phone. Because if it's quiet enough and they're looking and your phone goes off, you just told them where to look. Okay. Turn off your lights. Stay still. Stay where you are until an all-clear is announced. Please do your part to reduce. Real quick, tagging on what he said. Okay, we're talking about safety, we're talking about security and everything else. The situation that he had that he mentioned about the, the woman with the knife, she came in, she's one of our regulars, she is mental, okay? No joke, she's standing right here with a knife in her hand. We've got probably eight, ten security officers, all with their weapons at the low ready in case she moves at somebody. And a transporter. Oh. <laughs> right here. And she's just with the knife. <laughs> the security officers, wait, stop, stop. Don't be do, be do, be do. Had a situation not too long ago, real quick. Had a hazardous spill. Doctor, I had cones set up. We had security officers. We don't know what this liquid is. Doctor walks right through it. I said, you need to stop. You need to remove those shoes. You're now in quarantine. <laughs> Please, 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 situational awareness. If anybody has any real quick questions, you want to write this down. My personal cell phone is 313-655-1640. You can find that in the thing. I am PRedmon2, by the way. If anybody has any questions, I am a 24-7, 366 person. And I am deadly serious about this. Katrina will tell you I'm on the team, the crisis response team. I would, and I'm a retired Detroit police officer. I would rather get a phone call at three o'clock in the morning if you need to talk or you have a question or a problem than to get a phone call at nine o'clock in the morning saying they didn't have anybody to talk to. I'm deadly serious about that. I would rather you call me than not, okay? So I'm on midnights anyway, so. <laughs> Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, everybody. I do appreciate it. All right, and our last
presenter for today is Dr. Katrina Stokes with Enhance. We all just heard a lot of traumatic information, so how do we de-escalate that? Good afternoon, everyone. And this is where my skills of talking very fast is going to be helpful yes, because I'm aware of the time. So. No worries, no worries, no worries. And she is a part of the post-crisis response team, which is made up of Henry Ford employees across the entire system who've been trained in a model um, Dr. Jeffrey Mitchell's crisis response on how to handle critical events. At Henry Ford, we have a wealth of resources available to us. So many that because of time, I'm not able to save them. But if you come through the employee assistance program, and we're all employees, so if you look on HR, we have a tab under the HR Human Resources Department, Henry Ford, EAP Enhanced, and I have brochures with me as well. The post-crisis response team is under the employee assistance program, but again, made up of team members across the system. Some of the events that you all mentioned when you talked about some of the critical incidents happened, we've responded to them when we're aware of them. Um, so if you are aware of critical incidents that happen, such as patients attacking, you or a colleague or their family members attacking, you or a colleague, Please, you have, I have a companion that's with me on my pillow. Um, I'm gonna call 24 seven. Um, you can call the employee assistance number, which again, I have brochures for you, and they can connect you to me so that I can make sure you get the services that you need within 24 to 48 hours. The reason why you want that time is we want at least one to two sleep cycles. That's why the first thing I did 11 years ago when I came here to start this team, as I said, we want to call it the post-crisis response team. Um, so it's after the event. And the reason why you want to wait 24 to 48 hours, you want to allow for a sleep cycle. And you, pardon? Oh, I'm just to process everything. That's right. And she's a part of the team, so she understands what we're talking about. We know that when it happens, you're like, where's PCRT? Well, it, it's typically not helpful for us to come the same day because you're in shock. And you're looking at us like, you can't tell me anything. The patient shouldn't have talk, talked to me or my colleague. And so it's, you just need 24 to 30 hours to have some sleep cycles. And we can help you from there. So, what is the time? Oh, I got three minutes. Are there any questions? I was rushing really fast. Any questions that you can have? So let me tell you a little bit about the Employee Assistance Program. It's a free, confidential program. We do not document an epic. We're the only department that I'm aware of that does not have access to EPIC. We have our own database that's called EAP Expert that's actually managed by my neighbors in Canada. So we may have some Canadian employees. The company that managed our database, we keep our clinical notes, is not even in the country. And I have tested it with the computer department. They're not even able to open our icon, only our small team. So it's free of charge. It's not only available to you, because you perhaps go home and have conversations with the people you live with about the stressors at work, they can participate in the employee assistance program free of charge as well. It's short-term solution-focused counseling by licensed professional counselors, licensed social workers, and we used to have a limited licensed psychologist. He's not with the department anymore, but we provide that confidential counseling services um, free of charge. And if it's beyond our scope in terms of you need more than five sessions, we'll connect you to our behavioral services department and or make roles. We also have an awesome program that's called Work Life Services, which I like to look at as like a concierge service. That, and you're not in your head. Are you familiar with the services? Oh, sorry. You're just being attentive. But it's um, sort of like a concierge. <laughs> Go for presentations. Um, it, okay, thank you. Concierge service that can help with, they helped me plan a trip up north to Mackinac Island for my mom for a 70th birthday party. Um, they can help with, um, if you need help with tutoring for children that are at home with you, especially during COVID time. They can help with, if you need babysitters, and they can help with, help you find transportation, financial issues, anything that helps and you get on track with work-life balance. And I have... One minute, any questions? Okay, I think that's the fastest I've ever spoken in my life. <laughs> so, wow. Thank you. so 
it will take just about one minute to see uh, any any themes for questions uh, virtually. There, there was a comment in the chat about uh, the acknowledgement that there are CMS regulations that create rights for visitors on the facility, um, but there are also limitations to those rights as well. Okay, but we do need to be aware that there are some regulations that affect that space as well. Thank you for whoever it is that sent that message in. That's an important point to remind us. Thank you. All right. So thank you so much for... Yes. Uh, thank you so much for coming to our first Ethics for Lunch. Uh, please feel free. There are some lunches available. We'll also do our best to distribute those. Um, for anybody who is in need of a certificate or a CE, please scan the QR code. You can also email me acoin1 at hfhs.org for any questions or any other concerns. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day, everybody. We're on the website. Oh, exactly. Just hold your phone up and then we'll touch the... Anybody that didn't get a pamphlet on the uh, post-crisis... Oh, one of the questions in the chat was, were the slides and recording be available? Yes, it will be available within the next month on Henry's website. Okay, great. There's a... Uh, I mean, you can do it if you want. Yeah, so which one? Yeah. 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 Yeah.